Hello YouTube, I'm Dominicus, and this is the first episode of my new series that I'm calling Thor's Day. And in this series, if you haven't seen any of my previous announcements on it, I'm going to be taking a look at a different deity from different cultures around the world. And uh, not only just the world, but in various mythos, um, I may very well touch on Lovecraftian mythos later in the series, uh, but for today, I'm going to be starting things off with an Egyptian goddess by the name of Sekhmet. So, um, I'm going to be taking a look at various aspects of the goddess, and uh, yeah, I'll be going over all the finer points of it, and I do hope that you enjoy. Um, so yeah, this is my first episode, and it's on Sekhmet. Enjoy. The name Sekhmet is actually derived from the word Sekhem, which means power or might. Now, the name itself, Sekhmet, means one who is powerful. And Sekhmet is, from what I've read so far, definitely no pushover. She's definitely deserving of this name. Now, she's also known by another name, which is Nesert. And Nesert means the flame. And We'll come to that a little bit later. You will definitely see why she's known as the Flame. In Egyptian mythology, uh, a lot of the gods are depicted in anthropomorphic animal form. That is to say, oftentimes they will have the head of an animal on top of a human body. Now, in rare occasion, they will actually have a full-on animal form. And there are also several gods and goddesses in Egyptian lore that are completely human, uh, like so they have the human head, human body, etc. Now, in the case of Sekhmet, she is most often depicted as a woman's body with a lioness's head. Now, the lioness is one of the fiercest creatures uh, known in the Egyptian culture. Uh, back at that time. So really it's representing that same power and might as is described in her name. And along with that, um, where she is the lioness-headed uh, uh, deity, there is also, as I had mentioned, there's other forms uh, that are purely animal, and in this case there have been times where she's been depicted solely as a lioness. So more often than not though, it is the lioness-headed woman, uh, and that is how Sekhmet is seen most often. When it comes to pantheons, there are often times a deity associated with certain geographical locations within that pantheon's rule. So um, there may be certain deities associated with certain cities or city-states, um, different regions. Athena, of course, associated with Athens, the name. Um, various things like that. Now, in this case, Sekhmet was found to be associated with the lower or northern uh, part of Egypt. Now, that has been disputed over the years uh, from different scholarly sources, saying that it could be from the southern portion of Egypt, some even say from Sudan, uh, given the lioness, of course. Um, so, the location is not 100% certain, but in the next section I'm covering symbols and you'll see why Lower Egypt may make a little more sense. When it comes to deities, they are often associated with certain symbols that the worshippers can carry with them to represent their piety and their devotion to that particular god. Now, in the case of Sekhmet, she does have a few symbols that often appear in her depictions. One of the symbols is the sun disk. Now, the sun disk is important given that it relates her to Ra, of course, their father god. Now, the sun disk is his symbol where he is the god of the sun, um, etc. And she, Sekhmet, is also the daughter of Ra. And that's the reason why she has a sun disk. Now, she also has the color red associated with her. Now, the reason for that I will describe a little bit later in the mythos section. Um, that's It's a pretty interesting reason why she has red associated with her. Um, the next 
symbol would be the papyrus staff. Now the papyrus staff is important given the last section of location because the papyrus staff back in those times was representative of Lower Egypt. So that gives more credence to the fact that she originates from Lower or Northern uh, region of Egypt. So that would be why it's a bit of a stronger case there. And uh, the other symbol associated with Sekhmet is the Uraeus. Now, the Uraeus is a bit of an interesting symbol. You can actually find images of it um, affixed to the sarcophagus of King Tutankhamun, as well as various other pharaohs, and uh, it's also associated with some of the other gods. Now, what the Uraeus is, is it is a cobra reared up, basically ready to strike, and it is representative of royalty, sovereignty, uh, and divinity, basically. So it's, it's sort of a higher up, sort of like a high class symbol for uh, gods, pharaohs alike. Um, it's a very, very important symbol, and that is one of the ones that she is associated with. Uh, so those would be four symbols that Sekhmet is associated with. So the sun disk, the color red, the Uraeus, and the papyrus staff. Deities will oftentimes have different domains associated with them. Uh, these domains basically cover the area that they uh, have abilities in, um, whether it be granting good harvests, or catching more fish, or spiting your enemies, giving your troops valor. There's an innumerable amount of domains that were covered by the massive amount of deities in all of these different pantheons around the world. Now, in the case of Sekhmet, she has a little bit of a conflicting uh, domain pool um, in a couple of cases. Now, her domains typically revolved around destruction, so she had the domain of destruction, of war, fire, uh, sometimes plague, and also healing. Now, with that said, I've been able to find that several of the Egyptian deities um, and mythos in general revolves around balance, and uh, I'm also going to cover a little bit of this in my mythos section when it comes to how she gets balanced out. But generally, Sekhmet was a warrior goddess, and as such, her domain sort of fit the bill for that. Now, the worshippers of Sekhmet would often celebrate the end of wars with drunken festivals representing uh, something akin to what had happened in her mythos, again, I'm teasing that till the end. Um, and uh, the center for most of her worshippers was actually based in Memphis. And uh, on top of that, there was actually a temple of, uh, the Temple of Mut, which was actually given, uh, it is said, to have been given 365 different statues of Sekhmet so that the people could pray in front of a different statue every single day, uh, basically to appease her and make sure that they don't bring down her wrath. So yeah, they were pretty devoted to uh, Sekhmet. Those that were actually, uh, those that were actually devout, um, that followed Sekhmet, they were pretty darn devoted. So Ra was angry with the mortals for making fun of him and ignoring him. He decided to unleash his daughter, Sekhmet, upon them, and for many days, she slaughtered the mortals. After some time, Ra decided they don't deserve this bad of a punishment, and so he decided to put an end to the slaughter by taking many casks of red beer that was stained with, depending on where you look, pomegranate, ochre, whatever, and he tossed it down in front of her, and she, thinking it was blood, drank it all. After that, she went into a deep sleep for three days, and upon awaking, had lost her bloodlust. And so that's why the people celebrate after war with drunken festivals, that's why red is associated with her. As for the balance section, where she is destruction in the mythos, her counterpart is creation in the form of Ptah, her husband. She's also the mother of the god of healing, Nefertum, and that's how it all wraps up with healing and everything. And that's basically, in a nutshell, segment. Anyway, I'm Germanicus, and I hope that you enjoyed this first episode of Thor's Day.